the Shop, episode 139, Organic Acids and the Importance of Coffee Science, with Joseph Rivera. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DiFurio, I'm your host for the show, and I'm really excited to have you along today as we start to explore uh, coffee science and coffee chemistry on the show. This will be the first in a series of episodes, uh, lasting who knows how long, um, exploring the science and chemistry of coffee. You know, knowing more about the how and why behind coffee is key uh, as operators to being able to develop uh, very particular standards and then provide consistency for um, your staff and your customers and get buy-in from the staff when they ask questions about why do we uh, extract this coffee this way or why does this coffee taste different than that coffee. We want to have answers for those questions and uh, satisfy their curiosity and knowing more about what goes on on the inside of the coffee bean and you know on the farm, etc., is a whole world unto itself. And it's my intention to start to explore that world a little bit more on the show. You know, this show is by design going to focus on a lot of operational knowledge and growth and leadership um, because that's a lot of what goes into running a great shop. But um, oftentimes the science aspect of things gets uh, the short end of the stick. And so I'd like to take some time during the show this year to explore these topics. So the first one today, we're going to be talking with Joseph Rivera about his work as a chemist in the coffee industry, some insights into organic acids and why we should care about coffee science in the first place. So I'm looking forward to sharing this with you. Now, speaking of how things work. One of the things that helps uh, Keys to the Shop work is our sponsors. And I want to take time to thank them right now, starting with Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is a leading specialty coffee equipment supplier who curates the best equipment from around the world to fit perfectly with the needs of both their enthusiast and their professional customers. Helping you succeed in making great coffee at home or in the shop is what drives them. So if it's your desire to build the ultimate home bar, they've got you covered. If you want to uh, upgrade what you've got on your bar right now, or you're opening a store, expanding your shops, and you need professional commercial equipment to fit your situation, this is also something Prima Coffee excels in. If you're looking for the best equipment and expert assistance to go along with it, look no further than prima-coffee.com. Go to their website, email them, give them a call, and thank you, Prima, for your support of Keys to the Shop. This episode is also brought to you by Pacific Barista Series. The Pacific Barista Series line of non-dairy performance beverages is designed specifically for professional baristas and the standards for excellence they demand. Whether it's almond, soy, coconut, rice, or oat milk, its ability to take the heat from steaming, produce an unmatched silky texture, and keep the flavor balance of your beverage focused on coffee, which is really important, that makes it a perfect choice for your cafe's menu. They are a huge supporter of the barista community and specialty coffee at large. You see them everywhere, and they're just dedicated to the success of specialty coffee. I would highly encourage you go and check out pacificfoods.com and learn more about the Barista Series line of plant-based beverages and see how they can elevate the non-dairy offerings that you give your customers. Thank you so much, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the Shop. All right, so like I said today, we're going to be talking with Joseph Rivera, the Director of Research and Development for Coffee Intelligence. I'm really excited because Joseph has been on the ground floor of our industry's most respected institutions for establishing standards for uh, coffee science and coffee uh, quality. Now, Joseph, after receiving his degree in food chemistry from California State University, served as the research and development scientist for the Coffee Quality Institute, which is a nonprofit educational research foundation. During his role at CQI, he served as the organization's lead scientist to bridge science, chemistry, and technology with practical coffee science. This allowed him to play a key role in the development of numerous internationally recognized certification programs, including the Q certification, 
World Barista Championship certification, SCAA certification, Roasters Guild certification, as well as several others still in use today. In 2000, Joseph accepted the position of Director of Science and Technology for the Specialty Coffee Association of America, where he served as the industry's lead coffee scientist, lead instructor, and subject matter expert for the Professional Development and Education Committee. Now, over the years, he's been a frequent technical contributor to trade publications, international conferences, and he's appeared on National Public Radio, Australian Broadcast Corporation, and the History Channel's Coffee Documentary. He's been a frequent presenter at the SCA's annual conference and presented at numerous events. In 2004, he launched coffeechemistry.com, which is the largest scientific informational portal on specialty coffee. In 2009, after 10 years in the specialty coffee industry, Joseph left the SCAA to launch an independent consulting firm dedicated to technical training, consulting, testing, and addressing the future needs of the industry. In 2013, he developed the first and only coffee science certificate program with over 300 students currently certified globally. Now, in today's talk, Joseph helps us take a deeper look at some of the chemical components that make up our coffee and talks with us about his work that he, he's done over these many years in the industry to help establish this base of scientific knowledge still in use today and the base of knowledge around organic acids in coffee. Uh, also, we talk about the importance of knowing the science of coffee and exploring that. Why is it important for us to care about coffee science in the first place? I'm really honored to have talked with Joseph about these things, and I hope that you enjoy this conversation. So let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with the Director of Research and Development for Coffee Intelligence, Joseph A. Rivera. Joseph, welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm really excited to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yeah. Um, so your career in coffee, uh, you've just done so much, and you've been in the industry for quite a while. And what uh, what kind of background do you have in in your your origin story, like how you got into coffee and coffee science? Were you in science before getting into coffee, or, or vice versa? No, actually, um, I w actually got into chemical engineering. So when I graduated, I went to school and I was studying chemical engineering and a year or two into it I realized that there's not a lot of chemistry in chemical engineering it's more of um, pressures and pipes and although you're sending chemicals through these pipes it's a little bit different uh, than pure chemistry and so at the time I was going to switch majors to pure chemistry analytical chemistry um, and right about the time when I was going to switch majors um, the department the food science department just opened up at, at the Cal Poly and so it was an, an applied chemistry uh, topic field, and I figured, yeah, this would be sort of interesting to uh, get into. And so I switched majors and started learning more about uh, food chemistry, and um, that's sort of how it happened. The way I got into coffee was actually interesting. One of my professors had mentioned um, the SEO was looking for a scientist. I don't know how, how long you've been in coffee, but in about 97 or so, there was a big uh, infamous case where there was an importer that was importing Kona coffee mm -hmm. into the California, and it was really coffee from uh, Panama. And so um, after that fiasco, um, the gentleman got arrested. Uh, and so the SCA was a bit concerned as to how do we know that the coffee our members are buying if it's really from Colombia or from Brazil is there a way to actually test and so that I was hired on as an intern right after I graduated uh, college uh, really not knowing anything about coffee didn't really drink coffee um, spelled espresso with an X nice, <laughs> I mean that's nice. how bad I was uh, yeah so then we just started looking at you know um, some of the organic material in coffee so we looked at organic acids we looked at DNA all sorts of stuff to see if we could actually prove its origin. Um, obviously, DNA doesn't work because when you roast it, you completely destroy it. So we looked at uh, some organic acids. Those are destroyed as well. Um, we looked at things like uh, trace minerals, uh, which um, you could roast uh, to extremely dark, and they still s survive. And so it all started with this case, uh, this adulteration case in uh, here in the uh, California. Hmm. And so, so when you kind of cracked open that door via your profession, did you 
you start to just, uh, you went down the rabbit hole of, of coffee. Obviously, you stuck with coffee since that moment. Yeah, so it, it sort of started off as a small little project. And then um, after that project, uh, investigating the origin of coffee, looking at trace minerals, uh, we worked with the Kenya Research Foundation. The idea of having uh, auctions became popular. And so there was this, this a lot of uh, SL28 Kenyan coffee that sold for a record. I think it was five dollars and fifty cents. Okay, um, which was huge at the time because nothing had, had sold for that much at the time. And so then we started looking at um, why did this coffee did so well, and why what can we do to make this coffee? I mean, how can we understand what makes this coffee great? So then that's how the whole thing about organic acid started. We started looking at um, the acidities of lots of coffees. Um, and that actually served as the coursework for some of the stuff that uh, CQI started on the Q grader system. Um, the acid part is a one big part of the Q class. But So in that, you came to it with uh, knowledge already that maybe organic acids were the key to unlocking why uh, it was that that coffee tasted the way it did. Was that it, it, or was that something that was, was it a guess and then it turned out to be right? Um, it was sort of a both. At the time, like I said, I had just started in coffee and, and I never really tried a Kenyan coffee. I, I'd always tried uh, washed uh, Colombian coffees and central coffees. But when I tried one, I was so blown away. Yeah. Um, so we did some testing. We ran it through an HPLC and we measured the amount of acids uh, in each of the coffees and we realized that the Kenyan coffee had a significantly different acid profile than some of the, these other coffees. Hmm. So sort of as a whim, I figured, well, what if I took a, say, a Colombian cup um, and I added that differential acid to this cup? Can I change the profile of the cup? So we started adding drops of, of acid to, to coffees, and it was just amazed how you could completely switch or change the profile of a coffee just by adding small amounts of acid to it. Huh, so like the whole the whole cup profile changed. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, not only in terms of taste, but also aroma as well. Hmm. Um, acids, in addition to, we're all familiar with acids as providing an acid taste, but it can also um, change the profile of the volatiles that come off the coffee as well. So you started to see success with this process of you know playing around with organic acids and just kind of. Um, deducing from from the presence of these acids in coffee, you know why coffees did what they did in the cup, and that seems like uh, you were in the ground level of the establishment of CQI and these these uh, scientific standards for the SCAA. Tell us about the work that went into just establishing those um, criteria, the organic acids in particular. As, as part of what um, you can use to determine a coffee's quality? Yeah, so I think the, the acid work really um, contributed to coffee professionals in, a, in sort of describing some of the acids. Although an, an acid is an acid, they taste um, very, they have different profiles. And so I think, if anything, it sort of added a, a dictionary, if, if you will, to how to explain, for example, the acidity of malic acid versus acetic acid or citric acid. Um, so it gives you sort of um, standards to com- compare it to. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what's interesting is when it when you talk about sourness, there's actually um, something like 20% of the population actually gets it confused with bitterness. Really? And so, yeah, and so, which is really interesting because, you know, if you... Um, you know, let's say you have a coffee shop and you, you're selling coffee and someone comes in later and says, you know, your coffee is a bit bitter. Maybe they're, they mean sour or likewise, if someone comes in and say, well, your coffee is a bit sour, maybe underdeveloped, maybe they're really talking about bitterness. And so there's a certain amount of confusion of, of these terms. Um, and so I think a lot of the acid work sort of assisted in, in helping us explain not only what acidity is, but the differences between them. So when it comes down to it, uh, understanding 
really what's happening in the cup and the distinctions between these flavors that you're talking about. Um, why, why is it important for coffee professionals to really understand these things? I, I think understanding acids is really important because um, acids play a huge role in coffee quality. If you look at what um, we would consider as good coffees. Now, in North America, typically, or the Western side, we typically appreciate that acidity, whereas uh, usually coffees in Asia, traditionally in Japan, they usually stayed away from um, high acid coffees. Now, I think that's changing uh, with the introduction of third-way coffees. Um, but traditionally, that's sort of been one of the markers that, that the, the Western world has associated with good coffees having a, a certain amount of sweetness, a certain amount of uh, acidity to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, but I think overall, I mean, I think within the past maybe five, seven years, there's been a greater appreciation to sourness in general. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, the growth of sour beers. I mean, 10 years ago, I don't think anyone would have ever bought a sour beer. They probably would have thought it was a batch gone wrong or something. <laughs> but now, <laughs> but nowadays, I mean, there's all sorts of sour beers and there's uh, kombucha and all sorts of things. So I think the past five, six years have really been uh, a dramatic change for sourness. People are really appreciating things that are sour. Uh, I, which I haven't seen that in the 20 year career that I've been in coffee. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting because there's, you know, in Europe they have a lot of drinking vinegars. Um, it, there's an appreciation mm-hmm. for, for bitterness that we are, we tend to be overly um, focused on sweetness. Uh, and at the yeah. same time, you don't necessarily want a coffee to literally taste sour. Um, right, right. But, you know, as professionals, I imagine it's important for us to understand some of the mechanisms that go on, chemically speaking, that contribute to these things because we do want to provide a predictable experience for our customers. So if we're going to jump on the the acid train there uh, and it, it, we're getting lighter and, and we're producing these things daily, we, we need to kind of have a grip on what's happening uh, to make it happen. Um, so imagine that may be a good reason why people are uh, needing to know a little bit more about organic acids in coffee. Yeah, I mean, you know, one one example that I was thinking of is, um, you know, when you add lime or lemon to a food, it really sort of augments a lot of the base flavors in there. Mm-hmm. So, for example, like in, in when it comes to um, sweets, like I love key lime pie, but just imagine if you had a key lime pie and it didn't have the tartness or the sourness to it. Yeah. Okay. Granted, maybe it had the lemon smell or the lime smell. It it wouldn't taste like key lime pie. It would just taste like regular cheesecake, right? Mm. Not good. And so it makes this huge impact. Not only in taste, but also, like I said, it affects the aromas. Um, so I think there's more appreciation for sourness now than there, than there ever was, mm-hmm. obviously within moderation. So what are the, what are the acids, if you were going to choose like a set, cause there's a lot of, um, acids in coffee and, but there's like the, just like there's a lot of, you know, coffee, uh, types out there we only drink two of them. So there's only a few acids that we should really be focused on. It seems like what are, what's the, uh, the major players that we should be learning a little bit more about? Uh, the major players in terms of coffee, I mean, there's about 30, 30 or 40 organic acids. There's a few inorganic acids, but primarily they're organic acids. So they're carbon-based. So probably the greatest by far would be chlorogenic acid, um, in between maybe 7 to 10% uh, by weight. So just to give you sort of a perspective on what that number means, is when we think of coffee, most people think of caffeine. So coffee is about 1.2% for Arabica. So chlorogenic acid is about five times greater than that. So it's five times the concentration of what you would find in coffee. Obviously, it's an acid and caffeine is a base, but 
it, it, that sort of gives you an idea of how much more is is in there. Um, after that, it's citric acid. Citric acid is is quite uh, large, um, probably around that same range as acetic acid. Acetic acid actually starts off quite low. It starts relatively low, and then as you um, roast the coffee, it can actually increase anywhere between 20 to 30 times the concentration. So it's a huge increase. Yeah, and a lot of that comes from the decomposition of, of sugars, um, which so, plays a role in producing these acids. So it increases as you develop the coffee's natural sugars, as the, the Maillard reaction goes on it, it increases the uh, presence of that acid yeah so acetic acid a big source of acetic acid is there's some already in the bean mm-hmm. uh, but a lot of it comes from the fragmentation of carbohydrates so 40 percent of, of coffee roughly is um, um, cellulose and so when you're roasting the coffee these break down and they form uh, these very small short chain uh, acids, so like acetic acid, formic acid, uh, tiny amounts. You, you don't want formic acid. Um, but if you were to graph this out, there's actually a huge increase um, somewhere around the light roast. So a very light roasted coffee has a lot of acetic acid. And then as you go darker to, to a medium roast, it starts to drop, as does citric acid. Uh, there's some other acids that actually increase as well, but um, acetic acid plays a huge role in coffee acidity. So there's acidity. chlorogenic, there's the citric, then there's acetic, and I think that was. Th- is there are there more than that that uh, are? Well, what about malic? Yeah, malic is one that is similar to citric acid. Um, I mean, chemically, they're different, but in terms of taste profile, they're actually, they have the same sort of tartness. Um, they they break down at roughly the same temperature. I think, um, I think malic might be a little bit more stable than citric. But, um, yeah, I mean, so those, you know, four or five are probably the most important. There's quite a few other ones, you know, pyruvic acid, um, there's some lactic acid in there, but we're talking major p- contributors too. These are the positive acidity. contributors, like um, the ones that can yeah. contribute positive taste characteristics to the coffee. Right, right. And no doubt there's others that are uh, it, villains in the story that you don't want. You said formic acid is, is something we don't want, uh, for example. like what What is it that we don't want about that? <laughs> Uh, well, formic acid, it's interesting. Formic acid, you've heard of people um, moonshining where they make uh, alcohol in their backyard. Mm-hmm. And so um, you've heard of people drinking alcohol and then they, they go blind. And so the oxidation of methanol, if you're making alcohol, if you distill it, some of the first portion of the distillation is, eth- is uh, methanol. And when you... Um, when you oxidize it, you get methanoic acid, which is essentially formic acid. And formic acid attacks your optic nerve. And so um, it makes you blind. Obviously, in the case of coffee, you, I, you're not going to have that high of a concentration <laughs> of, of formic acid. Yeah. But, you know, I, I see people sometimes, they're, they're doing organic acid tasting. And, you know, we sell an acid kit that we use to train instructors and, and students for the Q class, and but I see a few people sometimes, um, and they have all the traditional acids, citric, malic, whatnot, and then in the back I'll see a bottle of formic acid. Oh. <laughs> and they always make sure do not drink this stuff. Do not drink it. Yeah, it's not um, that kind of blind cupping. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, so you're that's it. So so the, so these these acids are um, things that you want to, you're isolating and you have these kits, you have people tasting them so that they can you really identify in, in specifically in, when they're drinking a coffee. I'm assuming when you're drinking a coffee, they can say, oh, this one's high in malic acid. I can taste it because I've tasted this concentration of just, or well, this solution of just malic acid. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I assume that's the goal to be able to like drink a cup of coffee and then sort of uh, rattle off in your head 
different percentages that might be present in the cup. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a bit difficult because obviously tasting is, is a perception and there's all sorts of stuff going on um, uh, temperature-wise and in the environment. But but you do get a good sense of, of what's happening uh, when you're tasting these acids, you're making a comparison. Um, but, um, you know, what's interesting is uh, those studies that came out recently and the amount of caffeine in coffee actually um, affects the amount of sweetness that, that you can taste as well as, as well as sourness. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, for example, in the case of, of sweetness, um, th- there was a study done where they looked at the um, panel's ability to detect sweetness after they've c- consumed caffeine, water with uh, some fixed amount of caffeine in it. And it actually took them a, a little bit more time to detect the sweetness after they've drunk something with caffeine. Mm-hmm. So if you look at this sort of in real life term, you know, if you're ordering a donut with your coffee, a Robusta coffee, for example, it's going to, you pr- you're probably going to end up eating more donuts. <laughs> oh. Well, and, yeah. then, then uh, they should just stick to Robusta then at Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> just sell more donuts. Exactly. It, it's yeah, interesting so. how how that works. It, it just is not just an isolated presence, but it affects everything else around it. And um, when it comes to knowing about the presence of these organic acids in coffee, um, yeah. I assume you're trying to create a balance in the cup. Are there any particular correlations between origin and processing and the presence uh, or the certain percentages of these organic acids? Yeah, so that actually touches on an interesting point is is it's not so much the presence of any one acid, but really it's the ratio. Mm-hmm. So for example, if you look at um, if you look at say oranges and tangerines, they're essentially the same sort of fruit. They're both from the citrus family. But what makes them so different is the fact that a tangerine will have a different ratio of say malic to citric than an orange. Uh, there's some other acids in there as well and some other volatiles. But one of the key things is the ratio of these things because they really make a big impact. For example, like acetic acid in and of itself is extremely sour. It's even more sour than, than some of these really strong inorganic acids. Uh, but yet it's very weak. And so the the ratio of these things, if you mix, say, sugar with citric acid, um, if you taste just pure citric acid, it's quite tart, quite sour. But if you add some sugar to it, you tend to lose some of that sourness and you get more of a lemony kind of taste to it. Um, mm. So... If you mix it with other acids as well, you also change that. So the key thing here is really looking at the ratios. So if you want to get more uh, malic acid, for example, or citric acid, you may want to uh, combine it with a coffee that has higher amounts of those acids. So natural, since you have a lot more acetic acid, uh, just because of the process of fermentation, it's uh, quite high. And so... You know, maybe you could put a third of a natural coffee with a washed coffee if you want to augment your acidity profile. Um, well, that's so. interesting. You, uh, I think that's really what it comes down to is knowing ahead of time as you're looking at the coffee coming in and you have all this information about uh, the elevation and the processing type and um, whatnot, knowing ahead of time how, how maybe you should roast this coffee based on that information. So the natural process is going to have higher degrees of uh, acetic acid, you said, right? So Mm -hmm. you maybe want to develop that coffee a little bit more to counterbalance that acid's presence so you're not just tasting that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it makes a huge impact. And so washed coffees, I imagine, have uh, do they have more like malic? Uh, acid in them, uh, less acetic acid generally? 
they generally tend to have a little bit of lower acids just because the washing process tends to wash them out, mm -hmm. especially uh, acetic acid. There, there's a lot less. And then origins of, of the uh, coffee. Are there any uh, origins that are particularly easy to identify as, you know, gen you know, you can expect to have higher or lower degrees of these particular ads acids in the coffee? Um, I'm sure there are. I haven't done uh, such a large study, uh, but when, when I was working in the Kenya Research Foundation uh, with CQI at the time, we found, for example, like some of the Kenyan coffees tend to have, for whatever reason, at least in the lots that we got, were higher amounts of citric acid and higher amounts of phosphoric acid. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure why. I mean, uh, I was more focused on the chemistry end of things. But I think it comes down to more of an agronomy question. Perhaps the rate of respiration of the plant is different, uh, you know, those plants in, in Kenya as opposed to the ones in uh, Central South America. It could be a drying it could It could be any number of things. Um, yeah. But that one correlation that I found when I was analyzing all these coffees um, in the early days yeah, and imagine if if you were to do the same thing with other coffees, you'd probably find similar types of little uh, fingerprints of that coffee. It has this particular you know, propensity toward a, a higher acid, uh, you know, whatever one of those acids we're talking about. But um, mm -hmm. it, this is all striking me as being it. We like to get into the minutia of coffee. You know, we're we're coffee nerds, and we like to think about extraction. We like to think about the agronomy of coffee, and this is it takes it to another level of identify really um, dissecting the flavors of the coffee that you're tasting, and I, I can see that maybe some people would say, well, what's the big deal? Why do I have to be able to, or why is it uh, beneficial for me to be able to taste these things, and and really to just get into the science of of coffee uh, in general mm -hmm. as a as an operator, or why should I care about the science of coffee? Like, what is the? I wonder if you could just speak to the importance of coffee science in the specialty coffee industry. Yeah, I think coffee science. Um, you know, I've been in coffee for a long time, and and when I was teaching early coffee science back in you know the early two thousands, it was there wasn't that much interest. It was more of a uh, they were more interested in the craft and the story behind it. There was a little bit of interest in science, but not too much. Over the years, that's really increased uh, for whatever reason. It's really increased, which I think is great. But I think one of the impacts is, for example, right now we have this, um, we have a big growth of cold brew coffee. Mm -hmm. And we get, I mean, I get tons of questions of people asking me about the acidity of coffee. Is it, is it going to affect my stomach? And um, cold brew has less acids. But, I mean, we could go down a rabbit hole t just talking about pH, acidity, uh, perceived acidity, titratable acidity. There's all sorts of things we can talk about. Um, but, for example, in the case of cold brew, um, even though it may have a, a higher pH, meaning it's less acidic, I did... a uh, some work two years ago, and it actually had roughly the same concentration of acids than hot brew. I mean, yes, the pH was different. I presented this in Atlanta, and I got a bunch of, oh, no, cold brew is less acidic. Yes, it is in terms of pH as the number, but in terms of concentration, it's different. And so, you know, so this is just one example, um, but it really sort of I think the importance of coffee science really helps people in getting to the truth to what um, the situation is. I mean, we all have smartphones and we could all check these things on, on the go, but having some fundamental science um, really, I think, is good for the industry as a whole. Instead of having um, misconceptions or misunderstandings, you know, we talked about sourness and bitterness, how they're they're very different, but people get them confused acidity, uh, pH, um, perceived acidity. So there, there's a lot of terms that are kind of thrown out there, but they are they mean very distinct things, but they get sort of um, conflated and they sort of mean the same thing, but they're really, they're not the same thing. 
Yeah. Uh, well, that seems really important because you would want to make decisions, especially with your money as an owner, uh, based on truth and not based on marketing necessarily. Or it, you'd be back in the position of, um, you know, those, those folks that bought Kona coffee when it was actually from Panama, like you were talking about in the beginning. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Science um, for truth. You know, and yeah, I mean, and that that case really affected the Hawaiian industry, and the coffee industry, for for a long, long time. Yeah, it had the the ability to, uh, you know, back then, if, it, uh, if the work that you had done over these years had already been done, it would have been easier to identify. No, that's not Kona coffee. That's this is definitely not the signature that we would expect uh, based on our study of this. Yeah, I mean there there's there's markers that that can be used. Obviously, you're talking when you it's very difficult to prove where something came from exactly, but um, it gives you sort of a good statistical model. Maybe there's a ninety seven percent chance that it came from here and not here. You know, mm-hmm. so there's always that sort of um, gray area. But um, but overall, I think science, whether it's in coffee or in, in nutrition, I think over the years we're going to see more and more interest in that um, there's a lot of information online but there's a lot of misinformation as well and so you sort of need to separate the signal from the noise i think um and uh, you know i can't speak about other industries but at least for coffee i'm we're trying our best here to try to educate consumers uh roasters uh, engineers we've had qc people q graders ast people sort of understand what is really behind it so you're uh, fighting for uh, revealing the truth about coffee and educating the industry, and you're doing that through uh, programs. You've got the coffee science certification. You've got your website. Talk to us about the things that we can access resource-wise to take a deeper dive into these uh, into these things. Yeah, so the coffee science certificate program is a science-based coffee training uh, that I launched in 2014. Uh, prior to that, I had uh, co-developed the Q certification program for CQI and a, a lot of other SEA courses. Um, but unlike a lot of the courses, the CSC program is really focused on food science, food chemistry, and more applied um, science w- within the co- coffee world. Uh, the CSC program has three tracks, and within each track is about three to four different modules. Um, most of our sessions are actually done outside the U.S., um, although we do manage to do one, uh, sometimes two, in the U.S. Uh, But overall, it's been great. We've had lots of interest, and it's been growing over the past uh, four or five years. It sounds amazing. Um, What is the uh, website that we can go to to learn more about that and uh, stay in contact with what you've got going on? Yeah, so you could find, uh, we have a couple of sessions scheduled uh, but if you go to coffeechemistry.com forward slash certification um, or coffeesciencecertificate.com, that works as well. Uh, you'll see all the the program and what we cover. Uh, we just launched our second track, CSC2, um, last year in Italy. We have a partnership with Nova Simonelli. And so we just launched that back in November. So now we're offering two tracks, CSC1 and CSC2. Um, and then we'll probably launch CSC3 at some point next year, which is more focused on brewing chemistry, water chemistry. Um, so we try to sort of break it down into um, manageable chunks of, of uh, information. Man, that sounds amazing. I love it. Joseph, thank you so much for talking to us about uh, chemistry and about acids and uh, caffeine. It has just been fascinating and it makes me want to learn more and i feel like i i do know more now and can you know just be a a more informed professional and and serve people better so thank you so much oh my pleasure thanks for having me well i'm so grateful to have been able to have joseph on the show to help us uh, begin our exploration of this world of coffee chemistry and really to help us get motivated to learn more about the makeup of the coffee we make every day So thank you very much, Joseph, for taking time to talk with us about coffee science today. I really appreciate your time and all you've done for the industry in helping 
create this great base of scientific knowledge that we all benefit from. So if you want to learn more about Joseph's work and the coffee science certificate, or just generally coffee science, go to the website coffeechemistry.com. Real simple, coffeechemistry.com. And that's what you're going to find there. A lot of coffee chemistry. Articles detailing lots of stuff about organic acids and the general chemistry of coffee. You can really take a deep dive here at coffeechemistry.com. So be sure to spend some quality time there. And again, this type of stuff, this information, the science behind coffee, there's a whole world just waiting for us. And I'm excited to explore this even further with subsequent episodes of Keys to the Shop because knowing the how and why of coffee is one of the keys to the shop, obviously. So um, yeah, look forward to sharing more with you in the future. Now, if you want the show notes to this episode, you can go to keystotheshop.com. On the sidebar, there's a place to put your email address. And when you do that, you'll be signed up to receive the show notes sent directly to your inbox, along with news about Keys to the Shop, upcoming events and speaking engagements, and uh, Keys to the Shop consulting as well. So again, keystotheshop.com, put your email address in. It's as simple as that. And if you want to reach out to me directly with questions, comments, or feedback, or you want to explore working with Keys to the Shop Consulting to help you really take your operations to the next level, you can do so by emailing chris at keystotheshop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keystotheshop.com. Um, had a good time with you today. Thank you for joining me, uh, learning a little bit about coffee science today. And I look forward to our next time together. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.